this for about five days during the summer of 2019. So this was kind of one of the last big kind of um, um, public volunteer citizen science projects. I was able to throw, we had a lot, uh, mo the, most of the labor for this project were volunteers. Uh, we also had some professionals, but uh, a big volunteer um, research project. Uh, this, again, this was the summer of 2019, kind of the last big summer before COVID kind of um, uh, affected our field seasons. Uh, but now with possibly uh, some light at the end of the tunnel there, we might be able to start throwing some of these uh, citizen science excavation projects again. So uh, the Luck Waver Rock Shelter Testing Project is what we refer to as uh, a Section 110 project. Uh, and basically what that means is it's a citizen science public volunteer project. Uh, it, that means it's not, um, not only aimed at uh, kind of getting the public uh, the chance to participate in real archaeological research, but to really uh, kind of address pertinent research questions and further our archaeological knowledge with a project like this uh, through volunteer work. Um, not just so we're doing fun stuff, uh, of course, but um, also really are answering some research questions. Um, and the other thing is, is it gives us a lot of valuable data as a land management agency to help manage our cultural resources better. Uh, basically, the more we know about them and the more uh, we can put them into context, uh, the better we can evaluate them uh, when they occur in project areas, um, that kind of a thing. It, gives, it just gives us really good context uh, for management as well as research. Uh, so you can see actually here's uh, I don't know, can you everyone see my little arrow on there? I, okay, uh, so that's one of our, uh, these guys are all volunteers back over here. Uh, he's one of our professional crew here, his name is Travis. We actually had a, one of our volunteers was from Taos Pueblo from their natural resource staff. Uh, and that's her right there. Um, she was the uh, secretary for the natural resource staff on, at Taos Pueblo. So we even had uh, Native Americans that were helping do this excavation. Uh, and there's another volunteer there. Uh, so essentially what we had is 11 volunteers and six professionals. Um, and we kind of organized ourselves into two crews over that, over that uh, five days. Uh, one was a survey crew. So it was looking, doing surveys out in the view shed of the rock shelter in the valley, uh, looking for additional archeological sites, uh, especially ones that might be associated with the rock shelter. And of course the second crew was in the test, in the rock shelter digging the two test units here that you, you see here. Okay, so now before we kind of get into the results of the excavation, of course, we need to go into the physical setting or the uh, environmental context, um, uh, just to give everyone kind of a backdrop or a, a background context of the rock shelter. So this photo right here is of the Rio Castilla Valley. Um, you can see the rock shelter right there. And I'm actually taking this photo from the other margin of the valley. Um, and as you can see, the valley is pretty narrow. Uh, it's about a quarter mile wide. And just to give you a little context for where the rock shelter is actually located, it's actually uh, located down around Rio, the town of Rio Castilla. Uh, so that, that's over by Fort Garland. Um, so it's about 30 miles south of Fort Garland. And uh, if, you, if you were just to go to that little town of Rio Castilla and go up into the mountains just to the east of that, that's where this rock shelter is located. Uh, it's in a little valley, a little north-south running valley called the Rio Castilla Valley, um, which is the, what's photographed here. Uh, and this is also, uh, this is Rio Castilla Creek that runs through the valley, obviously. This was our field camp or excavation camp. You can see how close we were to that rock shelter. So we had really good access to it. Um, uh, it had excellent preservation. And I think one of the reasons it did is it was actually labeled as a mine on the topo map. It was labeled as the La Cueva mine. Uh, so I think a lot of people thought it was a mining feature, um, but when you actually go into it, it comes apparent pretty quickly that uh, it's a natural rock shelter. It's a natural feature, uh, just sort of a concavity in that vertical rock face there. Um, uh, so uh, I was really excited uh, with the fact that it was labeled that. And a lot of the local folks thought it was a mine as well. Um, the preservation that must have been there. Uh, and I think that did protect it, uh, which uh, you'll see here when we start getting into the results. Uh, basically, it sits at about 9,200 feet. So it's pretty high elevation. Um, it, it's a pretty large rock shelter. Uh, you can see the dimensions there. Um, you can get about eight to 10 people in there pretty comfortably um, standing. Uh, you can, uh, has a lot of headroom. You can, you can stand up in it. Um, one of the really interesting things about this, actually, this slide right here, is it shows the context of why that archaeological site is there. I mean, it's basically in a Garden of Eden as far as uh, hunter gather ecology is concerned. 
um, and actually sits uh, where there's in very close proximity to four different ecozones. And just like, you know, if you're modeling wildlife habitat, if you're dealing with hunters and gatherers, uh, you can kind of use the same models. Uh, uh, basically, they like transition zones. Uh, and the reason is because uh, at transition zones and uh, when you get a lot of different ecozones in close proximity, it really maximizes your floral and faunal diversity. So, uh, I mean, you just, your, your breadth and depth of resources really increases when you have all these transition zones. And I'll just point them out here. You got that spruce fir zone up here. Uh, we've got that pondo zone here. Um, we have an open meadow or open grasslands, and we also have riparian. So again, we got four eco zones and just like walking distance of this rock shelter. So the amount of resources they would have had to exploit would have been uh, pretty much optimal. Um, you can also see a spring that's located right here. It's actually, I mean, we actually observed water coming out of the base of this rock right here. So it's actually a, a active spring, an artesian spring, uh, which is another reason probably the rock shelters right here. Another uh, good thing is that it's at a confluence, uh, which is one of the ways um, we actually model for archeological sites, especially hunter and gather archeological sites. They tend to be located at confluences. Again, for the same reasons, the max, maximum um, kind of uh, uh, diversity of resources. So this is La Cueva Canyon right here, which is why the site's named La Cueva Rock Shelter. This is La Cueva Canyon. And it's at, and this is a uh, Rio Castilla Creek. So it's at the confluence of these two drainages as well. I mean, just a classic Garden of Eden hunter gatherer site there as far as resource base is concerned. This is from inside the rock shelter right here, um, looking out um, uh, to the field camp and into the valley. You can see it sits pretty high. It's about 25 to 40 feet uh, above the valley floor, uh, affords a pretty good view of the Rio Castilla Valley. Um, another reason that it was probably occupied here is there's lots of locally available stone tool materials. Um, there's lots of fine grained volcanics, given that this was a volcanically uh, formed um, little valley uh, and, and most of the Sangre de Cristos were volcanically formed uh, and then kind of uh, eroded and rounded off with glacial activity. But uh, so there's lots of rhyolite and basalt and things like that just laying around in the drainages that they were using um, to make stone tools. There's also a white opalite source. So this is one of the uh, sites that our surveys crews found uh, when they were doing surveys. You can see this ridge back over here. So right about here where the tree line is on this high ridge, our crew, one of our survey crews found two white opalite bedrock outcrops. Really pretty stuff. Just this white, opaque, high silicate content stone tool material. Um, and of course, we were really excited about it because it looked like it had been used for quarrying activities. Once we started to excavate in the site, Sure enough, we found a lot of white opalite in the artifact assemblage. So they were indeed using that, uh, uh, that source, um, that stone tool source, that local one that was back up in here. Um, once again, it's in a mixed eco, uh, conifer ecozone and an ecological transition zone, which just makes it a prime location. Um, and oftentimes when we do our models, when we uh, uh, model the landscape, like say we're doing a timber sale or a prescribed burn or something like that for, um, uh, for the forest service, we'll take our model and we'll lay it into that area and uh, it'll tell us where the highest probabilities are. And a lot of times they're based on these kinds of things, uh, slope, distance to water, vegetation type, those kinds of things. It's almost like modeling for wildlife habitat when you're dealing with uh, hunting and gatherers uh, or hunter gatherer ecology. So really uh, uh, just prime location. So as far as the rock shelter, again, you can see how big it is. Uh, there's two of our volunteers just sitting uh, right outside of it. Um, it does kind of look circular, so I can see why it was thought to have maybe been a mine. Um, but again, uh, just a natural, it, it was there, where there was conglomerate in it, it looks like. So there was looser uh, kind of bedrock inside of it. And the bedrock was harder on the outside. And over just thousands of years of freezing and thawing and weathering, that looser stuff has come out and eroded out of that, out of that space, uh, leaving that concavity. Um, as far as what it's filled with, so the rock shelter is full. Uh, the, the whole thing was filled up with about four, at least four feet of sediment. And that sediment is mostly uh, luss and weathering parent material. Luss is windblown dust. Um, weathering parent material, so basically like the freezing and thawing and water and rain over thousands of years kind of cleaves the, the walls and the ceiling of the rock shelter, creating a dust basically. So windblown dust, the weathering of the uh, rock shelter itself, and then, of course, the rock shelter floor is slightly facing to the west. So every time it rains, a gentle kind of sheet wash of sediment will wash into there as well. 
but just these these three processes the colluvium from the uh, uh, from washing in uh, during rainstorms uh, the weathering of the the parent material and the windblown dust has slowly filled this rock shelter at least four feet deep uh, with this stuff uh, uh, over the last probably 10,000 years um, is what we're finding in this thing. But we'll get into more uh, of that as we go on. And when you get that kind of depth and that kind of slow burial, um, you tend to get good preservation. Uh, and you also get separation between occupations, which helps you kind of establish chronology, which helps you look at use over time, that, that kind of thing. So just a really good context. All right, you can't do any research, you can't do any archaeological excavation without uh, research questions. Um, and I'm not going to go into a ton of details about these because this is, uh, I, I could go into a lot of uh, detail with these, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of glaze over them. Uh, the first one is uh, just for the purposes of this, uh, of this uh, presentation, and people have questions later, or they want to email me or whatever, they certainly can. Um, but we wanted to explore the long-term occupational history of that valley. There was no data. Uh, we, we had no uh, known archaeological sites in the Rio Castilla Valley. Uh, we didn't know much about the local culture history. Uh, which can be pretty different in different areas. So we wanted to explore that long-term prehistoric use of the valley, if there was one. Uh, we also wanted to know how these sites were used over time. So uh, different kinds of sites are used differently. Um, you know, people use, there's kill sites, there's habitation sites, there's residential sites, there's logistical sites. How are people, how are the prehistoric groups using this rock shelter over time? Was it changing or were they basically using it the same way over long periods of time? Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the, questions that's near and dear to my heart here. Uh, I kind of focus on Paleo-Indian studies. Uh, Ice Age archaeology is what, is what my expertise is in. Um, <clears throat> were those human groups, those really earliest human groups, I'm talking 10 to 14,000 years ago, using sites like this? Uh, and what I wanted to test is, uh, it's called the high-tech forager model. And I, I mean, I could go into a long amount of detail about it, but basically what it states, and it's a uh, model that was presented by a whole bunch of academics in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and basically, ever since then, those of, uh, uh, there's a lot of us are trying to test this model. Uh, try, and actually, in my case, I'm trying to refute this model. Uh, basically, what it states is uh, when human groups come into a, a new landscape for the first time, uh, or one of the first humans into that landscape, and they're not mapped onto their resource bases, they're, you know, they, they haven't been there for generations yet. They don't know where all the stone tools are, all the, bot the botanical resources, where the game's gonna be, you know, they have to learn that, they have to map onto that over time. And because of that, uh, most of those sites from that early period would be located along the major highways, uh, the major river corridors. You really wouldn't find uh, uh, really early sites like Clovis sites uh, outside of those major river valleys or outside major resource areas. Um, one of the reasons why there's so many of those sites in the San Luis Valley is because of the wetlands. Uh, so that falls into line with this model. The kinds of sites that they wouldn't be occupying according to this model is patchy sites, sites that would be uh, obscure. You wouldn't know where they are. Uh, it would take you a while to map onto those landscapes. And one of the things they mentioned specifically is high elevation rock shelters. Those would not have been occupied by Paleo-Indians according to the testing, according to the high-tech forager model. Well, I, I, I've been in a, involved in a couple of research projects where we have indeed found uh, Clovis and Folsom occupations in high elevation rock shelters. I've uh, got three so far. Uh, it's not enough to repeat the model. That's why we're continuing to look. Uh, so, but we're starting to uh, gain enough evidence to suggest that oh, they indeed did know where these sites were. Um, and uh, almost immediately they were able to map onto these landscapes and, and uh, uh, know where these resource bases were. So anyways, that's one of the models I'm trying to test. And then the last question kind of feeds into that. You're not going to find Clovis sites, you're not going to find early paleo Indian sites if the eight, that age of dirt isn't there. And so that's basically what this last one is, is what's the depositional and geoarchaeological history of that rock shelter? Are there what we call Pleistocene or Ice Age deposits in this rock shelter? Are the contexts even there? So that's what we we're kind of looking at as far as uh, research questions. Methodology. Um, <clears throat> uh, basically, we use standard archaeological methodology. Again, I'm going to... Um, Anyone has any questions about the methodology? Uh, we use really standard academic uh, archaeological methodology for both the excavation and the survey. Uh, basically, this shows you the plan view of the rock shelter, just kind of the bird's eye view of its size. And then also where we put those two one by one units right inside the drip line, which is 
often where you're going to get the best stuff. Uh, if you put it on the drip line, it's pretty heavily disturbed. And they tend to not occupy right outside the drip line. So this is where we decided to put our units. You can see there's lots of room left in that rock shelter for more. However, uh, we, it, it, it's a good idea. I'm, we're not going to do any further research digging into this. Uh, we'll do more research here, but not uh, digging more. Because the idea is you want to save some for future generations when as technology improves, as methods improves, as theories improve, uh, to allow uh, some of the site to be there still if someone wants to come back and try to address some other research questions. So um, once again, we just use standard survey methodology. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. This is what we do for the Forest Service uh, when we go out and clear projects. We'll go out and uh, do surveys spaced no more than 30 meters apart. We'll find sites and we'll document them on forms like that. That's basically, um, again, if anyone has any questions about the methodology, um, go ahead and send me an email or uh, I'd be happy to discuss it afterwards. All right, now we can get into the, into the, into the results here. So in all, and I'll explain this graph here in a minute, it was getting a little uh, um, busy. Uh, so I'll explain the graph, gra the graph here in a minute. You know, we had 679 lithic artifacts that came out of this, this limited testing out of these two one by one units. Um, and lithic, you know, stone artifacts, you guys probably already knew that, but 689 bone fragments, nine pottery or ceramic fragments, 16 metal artifacts and 19 miscellaneous items. Um, and you can see this graph here, so it's not labeled, but uh, this is the depth right here. So this is like zero to 10 centimeters, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. So the depth increases as you go right to left. And these are the number of items uh, as it gets deeper. So the orange is bone fragments. Uh, the purple is stone tools or stone lithics. Uh, the uh, uh, red is ceramics or pottery. Uh, the blue is metal and the yellow is miscellaneous fragments. So you can kind of see that somewhere between about 40 and 70 centimeters below the ground surface is kind of the most intense occupations here. Uh, it makes sense that it would start out light. You know, was, when the rock shelter was first discovered um, and this old is probably eight to 10,000 years old. We'll get into more detail about that as we get into the rock shelter here. Um, and then of course the uh, occupational intensity as hunter and gathering groups mapped it onto their um, settlement rounds. They tended to revisit several, the same several sites a year um, as part of what we call their settlement round. So as this site became mapped on and people were starting to revisit and frequent it more often, you can see that the intensity of use based on the artifacts and bone that's there increased. And then it suddenly drops off at the very end. Um, which is really interesting and I'll, and I'll talk about that a little later on in the presentation as well. But one of the noteworthy things here is you notice there's no ceramics or metal items below level four, which is what would we would expect stratigraphically. So uh, pottery and ceramics uh, are a very late kind of invention uh, overall in the archeological record. When you think of 14,000 years worth of archeological record, uh, pottery in North America, the very oldest pottery is about 2,400 years old. So it, it really showed up very late before 2,400 years. There just wasn't any pottery in North America in the archeological record. Um, in the Southwest, it's a little later, around 2,000 years. Uh, so, uh, um, but yeah, we don't find it. We're not, so we're finding it in the upper deposits. Uh, but after level four, we just found bone and stone below that. Also the metal items were, were, were found in the upper levels. Again, you know, uh, uh, this stone, stone tool technology for most of prehistory. Uh, so we would expect the metal and pottery items to not be very deep, to be in the upper levels, to be more recent, uh, which kind of tells us that this site hasn't been mixed. It's somewhat stratigraphically intact uh, uh, because the things are where we would find them as far as their depth, as far as their particular. Depth. So that's, that is worth noting. So here's the 11, uh, so included, let's see here. Uh, included in these numbers are 11 projectile points, six bifaces, stone knives, uh, one scraper, one retouched flake, and one piece of ground stone. It was a complete mono. But here's the 11 projectile points. And this is pretty interesting because, again, it, it, this kind of shows that uh, the deposits weren't mixed, that they were kind of the layers, the campsite layers that went down, I mean, again, four, all the way down from the surface to four feet below the ground surface. And we are still finding stuff. Uh, so we stopped. The reason is because the uh, sediments were just hard as a rock. I mean, we're having to use rock bars down that low uh, just to break up the sediment. Um, 
I'll talk about that a little later too, though. So anyway, here's the 11 projectile points found. These three right here were found out on the apron, so they weren't found in the uh, excavation. These were all found in the excavation. These were found out of context, and the aprons kind of the sediments out in front of the rock shelter. They call that the apron. So these were found out on the surface, out of context, out in front of the rock shelter. Uh, these were found in the excavation. So this was found in level two, level three, level four, level five, and level six. So this was getting to be 60 centimeters below the ground surface. And one of the reasons we know it's stratigraphically intact here is you notice that the technology shifted over time. So uh, along with pottery uh, coming out around 2000 years ago, I mean, something major culturally was happening around 2000 years ago. A lot of people are working on, uh, I know a couple of people were working on their PhDs on this very topic because we don't know what happened, uh, but something major did because we suddenly get pottery showing up at 2000 years ago and it, the technology as far as projectiles shifts from Adle, adle the bone arrow. So the bone arrow and pottery were suddenly invented in, in use at about 2000 years ago. And before that, we don't see arrow points. They're, they're called dart points before that or spear points, but we don't, so we see arrow points and pottery both come out about 2000 years ago. And you can kind of see in these deposits here, the arrow points giving way to the dart points, the adle, adle points. So we probably just in the excavation. So we're looking at about 30 to 40 centimeters below the ground. That's probably a 2000 year old layer right there, just because we know in hundreds of other sites throughout the Southwest and Plains that technological transition has been identified and dated. So it's really thoroughly dated to around 2000 years ago. Again, that's when pottery and bone arrow came out and you can just see it right here in the te technology. Uh, if, if you aren't familiar with an adle, adle uh, if you can imagine an Australian Aborigine, um, they have that throwing stick and then they have a spear about as tall as a person. And what you do is take that throwing stick. That throwing stick gives you extra leverage. It gives you an extension on your hand and extra leverage. So you take the throwing stick and you hold it and you put the spear in it and you hold the spear in it. And of course, the spear is going to be way longer than the throwing stick. But when you whip that thing, you let go. And it, that's what people were using in um, uh, North America for thousands of years, uh, probably starting at about 14,000 years ago and going all the way until suddenly it was replaced by the bow and arrow at 2,000 years ago. Um, but anyways, you can see that these heavy projectiles are from those dark points and then the lighter points from that lateral. So again, suggests that there isn't a lot of mixing, it suggests that we've got somewhat intact strategically, uh, which, which speaks to that preservation that I talked about. Like people haven't been digging in this rock shelf before uh, to mix it all up. Um, I think it's because mostly, I mean, look, look how close it was to that road into that, that old cow camp that we used as our excavation camp. And for this to be this undisturbed, um, I have to chalk it up to the fact that it was thought and labeled on the topo map as an old mine. So here's the uh, six bite faces uh, or uh, stone knives, the scraper, here they are right here, scraper, retouch flake, just showing you some of the tools. There's that mono uh, that we found. We also found two fire pits as we were excavating down through these sediments and we dated them both uh, with radiocarbon dates and I'll go into that a little bit. But the first one we came down was in level two and it was this perfect ring of rocks. Um, and that one actually dated, we got some charcoal out of it, it dated to a thousand years ago. It was like 1,012 plus or minus 40. Uh, so a pretty good thousand year old date on that. And this mono was laying like, so you had this ring of rocks and then the mono was laying right next to it. Um, so it was probably used in preparation with this hearth. Like we came down on this hearth, this hearth with the model next to it. It was like a Pompeii fire pit. You know, it was like all left, right? As it was, um, this side was facing up when we came down on it. That side was facing down. Uh, and again, laying right next to that fire pit. And you can see that it's got some heat altering. Uh, so it was probably used in association with that fire. And then whoever was using it just left it next to it and it got buried and sat there for a thousand years until, until we came down upon it. Pretty neat. Um, let's see. Of the 689 bone fragments included in the assemblage, 249 or 36% were burned. That's a really high percentage. And 74 or 11% displayed evidence of butchering and processing. And by that, uh, I mean stone tool cut marks or impact fractures from processing marrow. So what they would often do is, uh, right when they got a kill, they take the long bones, take a big rock, smash the middle of it, and there's, you get the greasy marrow out of it. Um, I've actually tried it before. 
um, uh, um, with an experiment where we butchered a bison using stone tools and then we broke open its long bones and ate the, the marrow as well. It's actually pretty tasty. It's salty. It tastes like butter, um, but a really highly sought after uh, nutritional sort uh, for, for hunters and gatherers, especially bison hunters. So uh, it looks like they were heavily smashing these bones open. Uh, and just heavily processing and cooking these animals, um, which I'll go into more a little more detail a little bit long a little, a little bit later. But here you go again. Here's the depth, going all the way down to four feet below the ground surface. And then here's the number of items of each of those things. So the yellow is total bone. Uh, the uh, green is the amount of that bone of the total bone burned, and then the purple is the amount was actually had butchering uh, evidence on it. And uh, there's a lot of good papers out there that suggest if you actually see cut marks and impact fractures on bone, the amount of butchering intensity that would have had to occur would be about four to five times that much. So but what I mean is like for every four slices you take when you're doing a butcher, basically only one of those is going to show up on the bone. So if you have 11, if you have 74 bones that show evidence of butchering, it's probably five times that many that were actually involved in a butchering activity. So again, this is really heavily butchered and processed stuff. Let's just show some burned bone here. So this is what uh, carbonized bone. It just means it's blackened. Um, and oftentimes that does mean cooking in an archeological site, but it, there's a lot of natural ways that can happen. Prairie fires, all kinds of things. Uh, the other kind, which is called calcined bone, where it kind of turns white and chalky and almost blue. It almost kind of just falls apart like chalk. It takes intense, intense heat for that to occur. Uh, it can happen in nature, but not as readily uh, uh, as uh, the carbonization can occur. So it, it almost, it, it has to be in a very um, uh, discreet location and heated for a long period of time at a very hot temperature. It almost always means cooking when you see calcined bone, because uh, unless like a bone is buried next to a tree root, and that tree catches on fire and then the root burns underground and smolders next to it for days, you're not gonna get calcined bone. So uh, calcined bone is almost usually interpreted, especially in an archeological site, is, is cooking, uh, it's, it's cooking the animals. Uh, here's some of the butchered bone. Again, we have 600 bones, you know, so, but uh, this, is, this is some of the butchered stuff. Uh, you can actually see, and I have a better picture a little later, but you can see the stone tool cut marks right there on that one. Uh, these are all impact fractures. So, and what we call this is green bone break or spiral. So when an animal is fresh or green and you take a rock and you break the bone, it tends to create a specific break that's different than any other kind of break that you, you'll see. Uh, once it dries out, uh, when, once after a couple of weeks, you won't get this anymore. You'll get what we call dry bone breaks or crush breaks. There's a lot of different kinds of breaks, uh, but oftentimes in an archeological site, a green bone break, when you hit it, it tends to create a spiral fracture and it tends to have a really sharp edge. Um, you can almost like cut your finger on the edge of the bone because it's so sharp. Uh, and that's all what this is. This is green bone break, spiral fractures. Uh, there's a great impact fracture right here where they just smashed the middle of the long bone and just sent little fragments flying. Um, but again, just a good example of some of the butchered bone on the site. Here's the two features or fire pits that we mapped. So this is the first one. Uh, this is feature one. This is the one that dated to a thousand years ago. And then about 20 centimeters below this one, we found feature two, which is this one. So this, there are actually two different shots. This is showing it as we came down on it from the plan view. And this is showing the profile. So after we had excavated through it, uh, this was in the center of the unit. So it didn't show up in the wall. This one here, this one showed up in the wall because it was near the wall of our test unit. So it actually showed up in the profile on the wall. You can see it's a perfectly preserved hearth. Uh, see the, ox the oxidized sediment underneath, uh, the charcoal from where the main the main hearth was. Uh, this one again dated to about a thousand years ago. This one dated to two thousand four hundred years ago. And we'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll show a profile here in a little bit that um, explains that a little better. But one of the cool things about this, you notice that there's not a lot of black charcoal in this. There was just kind of gray ash because this was a surface ring of rocks uh, that didn't. It wasn't rock lined. So sometimes they'd prepare fire pits where they'd put rocks all the way underneath it. And then they'd burn a fire. Um, and that's what they did with, with number two here, with, with, with feature number two. They actually uh, rock lined the bottom of it. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why it's so intact. Uh, so rodents actually burrowed through feature number one. Um, that's why there's no charcoal in it. They actually burrowed through the, the middle, of, you know, they love burrowing through buried hearts. 
So once a fire pit is buried, it's already been disturbed. It's got all kinds of food bits in it, charcoal in it. You know, charcoal uses medicine for a lot of animals. You know, when animals aren't feeling well, they'll eat charcoal. Uh, so when we, almost every archeological um, dig I've ever been on, rodents just seek out fire pits and they wanna burrow through them, uh, which is what they did for feature number one. Feature number two, they couldn't uh, because it was rock line. There's rocks going all the way underneath it. And you can see these right here. Those are actually rodent burrows. Those are ro extinct rodent burrows right here. They couldn't get into the feature because there was rocks right here. And there's a, <laughs> there's a rock right there as well, but which helped preserve this. They weren't able to go through it. Uh, so our probably most reliable and best date because it was sealed is in feature number two, which dated to 2,400 years ago. So, um, and we'll get back to the profile here in just a minute. But as far as the diagnostic projectile points, this is really cool because oftentimes uh, you won't see a mix of different groups like this. Um, the San Luis Valley is one of those classic places where we get Great Basin cultures, Plains cultures, Southwest groups, all kind of converging here and using this for thousands of years as, as part of their settlement rounds. Um, whereas like I've done a lot of bison excavations and rock shelters out on the plains. It's pretty much plains groups. I've done some excavations down, uh, you know, around Santa Fe and down on the Southwest, same deal, it's, it's Southwest groups. Here you have this like really interesting convergence zone. And I think we're seeing that um, it's been known that it's been kind of a uh, uh, melting pot of different cultures like the Taos area and the San Luis Valley, at least since historic times. But what this excavation is telling us, this, is, this has been going on for at least 5,000 years, if not longer. Um, but anyway, I'll get into that. Uh, so we've got a bunch of arrow points that aren't really diagnostic of the plains or the Southwest. Uh, they get kind of generalized uh, toward the very end of the late prehistoric. Uh, but I'll just talk about the points we do know about. So this is right here is a classic and what we call a medio, a medio point, and it's a classic southwest typology. And actually, uh, they've been found in many, many sites throughout New Mexico and Arizona and have been really well dated from about 2,500 to about 1,500 years ago. And actually, what they're kind of named in the literature is the first bow and arrow hunters of the southwest. And if you actually look at their the stratigraphic position, <laughs> Uh, the last, the thing right below it's an atlatl point. So uh, that kind of holds true here. Again, uh, we were able to verify that, that uh, that shift from atlatl technology to bow and arrow technology. And the reason they call them medio is because it's in the middle. You're trans transitioning from atlatl to bow and arrow. Uh, but anyway, that classic Southwest uh, um, chronology there. Uh, we also have an uh, Elko series or what we call a Pelican Lake point. And that was found on the apron. This one right here is out of context, but I've been on sites, I've actually excavated a bison kill site in uh, around Sterling, Colorado with those kind of points. And, and, and uh, they're very well dated from about 3000 to 1500 years ago. Uh, classic late archaic plains bison hunters, but they were using this rock shelter at one point in time. Uh, so we have that. Uh, we also have the San Juan projectile point right here. That's, a, that's probably one of the best, the most ubiquitous and best dated cultural complexes or archeological cultures in the Southwest. Uh, the San Jose points, uh, sites and point, they're mostly in Arizona. Uh, that, that, that's where they're mostly found. Uh, all, however, they are found in New Mexico as well. Um, we do find them in the San Luis Valley, but this is kind of Northern, um, uh, like part of their territorial zone. We don't find them North of this at all. Uh, the San Luis Valley is their Northern extent. Uh, they're much more abundant down in New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, again, really well dated to a, from around 5,500 to about 3,500 years ago. Um, another classic Southwest typology. And then below that, uh, what we had was the, in level six, we had what we call a McKean point um, or a Hannah point. And again, these, are, these guys are classic middle archaic bison hunters. These guys are late archaic bison hunters. These guys are middle archaic, like, you know, the Elko series. Uh, it's late archaic. These guys are middle archaic, the period before that, bison hunters. Uh, McKean is actually, I, I focused uh, my graduate research uh, for a time, uh, and then I changed topics, uh, but uh, uh, I really focused on McKean for a while. Really interesting uh, archaeological culture and cultural phenomenon. Uh, unlike any other of the Plains groups before and after them, we find them in all these different ecological settings. I mean, you find McKean sites at 13,000 feet, you find them in the desert, you find them everywhere. Um, it's almost like there was a cultural explosion because the periods we see before that, they're pretty limited to where they are geographically. 
And the periods after that, they're much more limited, not as limited as they were before McKean, but still limited. Um, so they were doing something that allowed them to get into all these different niches and zones and things like that that previous groups hadn't. So I'm not surprised to find one here in this rock shelter. Um, again, and they're really well dated from about 5,000 to about 3,000 years ago. Um, so pretty interesting that we got this just like intermittent use of plains and Southwest groups all the way through uh, to modern times. And at least going back 5,000 years, probably longer. Here's the ceramics, the pottery. Uh, we didn't find much of it. Uh, we found nine pieces, but this was found in level two, level three, level four. And again, we didn't find any below that, which makes sense uh, given the chronology and the fact that this site's pretty well intact. Uh, you can see the incising on this. So this has all been identified as what we call Taos incised pottery. So this is classic Taos Pueblo. Um, so there, and, and it dates to about a thousand years ago, uh, pretty solidly. Uh, of course, they've uh, dated, I'd say, at least a couple of hundred sites down around Taos and Pickery's Pueblos of sites that contain this pottery. So really solid date of around a thousand. Um, not sure what these other kind of pottery types are above it. Uh, there, there's a lot of like, there's Ute grayware, there's Pueblo grayware, there's some other stuff. There's just not enough of it there. It is micaceous. So it could be Hickory Apache, it could be Pueblo, but it's much later uh, than everything else. So, so we're talking maybe a few centuries old. Um, but we know this is Taos Pueblo pottery here. So pretty interesting that we have a Pueblo occupation later on in the rock shelter. All right, this is kind of my favorite slide just because I like stratigraphy and I like geoarchaeology. But uh, so this shows the entire profile of both test, test units side by side. So the wall of both test units uh, going from the surface all the way down to where we stopped excavating. And you can see how many, how good the layering is. Um, the layering was really uh, very, very intact. Um, all this stuff is just uh, descriptions of the sediment. So we use uh, Munsell soil charts so that we're not like, no, it's green, no, it's blue, no, you know, so we're all using the same color definitions. Um, but we also kind of describe the sediment, uh, like whatever, yellowish brown compacted silt loam with calcium carbonate inclusions. So, uh, but yeah, really well layered. Uh, going all the way down to uh, 110 centimeters below the surface. That's four feet below the ground surface. Um, and just to uh, uh, re uh, point out again where that first feature was. So that first feature was found right here. That one we found the mono next to. And the reason it's not in the profile is because it was found in the center of the test unit. So it didn't show up in the wall like that second one here. Uh, but that one dated to a thousand years ago. And it was right here. You can see this one we dated, we got a good radiocarbon date on that of 2,404 plus or minus 24 years. And then of course, below that, we had our San Jose and McKean points. Uh, so you look thousand years, 2,400 years, three to 5,000 years. Again, it just suggests with the layering that this is pretty darn well intact. Uh, you can see these Crotavina in here. So Crotavina are the extinct rodent burrows. I mean, yeah, it has caused some disturbance here and there. So the way I would describe this as far as geoarchaeology would be intact macro stratigraphy with some micro stratigraphic mixing. That's how I describe this because there's definitely some mixing, um, but uh, uh, generally intact. Uh, pretty neat archaeological site. And you can see right here where I said possible Holocene Pleistocene transition. So that Pleistocene is the Ice Age and Holocene is the modern era. Holocene began around 10,000 years ago. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what that transition is, but if you think about it, we found, uh, uh, you know, three to 5,000 year old points up this high. We continue to find just hundreds of stone tools and butchered bone going all the way down to level 10. We just didn't find any other diagnostics. So diagnostics are basically projectile points or other stone tools that have been dated elsewhere and named, and we understand what they, their relative date is. Uh, so we did find a lot of artifacts and butchered bone going all the way down to level 10, but the last diagnostic we found was the McKean point. Um, but if you think about 5,000 years with the sediment being 50 centimeters, another 5,000 years worth of sediment. And again, this is a rough estimate and we're gonna have to do more research to try to get a date because we didn't recover any charcoal down here. Um, and we didn't find any Paleo-Indian artifacts down here, but just based on other sites I've excavated, um, it's called caliche. And when you hit this really compacted stuff that's got these calcium carbonate uh, inclusions in it, 
it gets so hard. Like I said, you got to use rock bars to break it up. Um, I've been on other sites where we do encounter those layers and they have been Pleistocene layers in age. Um, I don't know about this local context. Again, uh, we're going to need to uh, get down there, see if we can find any uh, diagnostics. And what would be better is to get a, a radiocarbon date down here at this level. But just from my uh, past experience in other sites, I'm pretty certain this is the Pleistocene Holocene boundary right here that we went through. So that would tell us that there's at least 10 to 12,000 years worth of continual use of this rock shelter, going all the way through that Taos Pueblo occupation. Pretty neat. Uh, here's the two features again. This is feature one, and the mono was actually found laying right there, right next to feature one. Um, I was out with the survey crew when they found it, and I wish they would have taken a picture of it uh, when it was in place, but it was really cool to come down on that. And then you can see this is feature number two, that it's kind of in the wall. That's why that charcoal stain showed up in the wall, but you can you notice that there's rocks, like I mean, there's rocks going all the way underneath it. So they built rocks, and then they put the fire they, they lined the bottom of it with rocks and then built a fire on that, which is which just made it completely intact. I mean, we had like all the charcoal was in this thing and we had chunks of wood even. I mean, we could have gotten species of what they were burning in that thing. But um, again, that was a really reliable day, 2400 BP. Uh, so let's see. I got to catch up here on my... Okay, so, so now we'll talk a little bit more about the stone, uh, the, the stone tools and the artifacts. Uh, the stone, actually the lithics in this case. Uh, so there were 679 of them found uh, and there was only 20 tools, which is a remarkably low number of tools for that many artifacts. Uh, this just kind of lays out where the, uh, uh, so this, in this case, this is the depth going up and this is the number of tools in each level. So you can see level four actually had the most tools. It had uh, retouch flake, a couple of projectile points, biface scraper, but in any case, uh, there's not a lot to say about the tools because it was very few, um, which tells me this isn't a habitation site. These people weren't living here. They, this was, they were visiting this as a logistical camp, probably a hunting camp, which I'll go into a little more detail here. Um, I can't. I can't remove that bar up there above my thing. So, <laughs> so uh, basically uh, tool finishing and refurbishing flakes, which are micro flakes. So uh, they're no bigger than probably the size of your pinky fingernail. Uh, and the way they're made is you take, they're not used from for cussing. They're not made from using an antler. They're actually used where you take the antler, flip it around, use the tip and you press flakes off. So those are pressure flakes and they're only used for finishing. Uh, they're basically used to either finish a, almost a formal tool that's complete, or if you break a projectile point, you break a formal tool to kind of reshape it. So if you look at like the depth here, to going down to 10 centimeters or all the way down to a, a, a meter below the surface, and then the number of items, the green here is, to, is all pressure flakes. The orange is biface thinning flakes, and the, uh, the blue is core. So the core reduction and biface thinning flakes are made from percussing. Whereas the others, again, made from doing that. So they were pretty much coming to the site with finished tools. Uh, they, were, they were not making stone tools here. Uh, they were very far away from the sources that they were using, which is interesting because there's local material uh, around. Um, but they were coming to this, this campsite, um, looked like through the entire sequence, you know, going all the way down, you know, all the levels with pretty much finished tools. Uh, and the only flint napping they were doing was to fit, repair a broken tool they had during a hunt or to uh, oftentimes they would have a bunch of blanks, like a bunch of bifaces that whatever you encountered, you could quickly get one of those out and make it into what you needed, whether it was a point, a drill, a scraper, but you'd have several what they call blanks or bifaces that could be fashioned into any form of stone tool quickly. Um, so basically that's what looked like was happening is they were coming with formal tools and they were only repairing or finishing them. And that, and, and that graph speaks volumes uh, as far as that's concerned. Material types. Again, a lot of the material types uh, were local, uh, which tells me that the groups were probably local. Uh, black basalt dominated the, uh, the assemblage. Uh, Pedronal chert, which is actually found around Taos, uh, which is interesting, um, was 17% of the entire assemblage. And, and you know, going through all the levels, 
Obsidian was actually pretty low, which I'm surprised about. Uh, it only comprised about 8%. Um, and then, oh, by the way, bl this black basalt here, you guys know where San Antonio Mountain is? Um, just to the south, um, down around Tres Piedras. Uh, that's, that's where this black basalt comes from. There's a big prehistoric quarry there. Uh, and that's where the stuff comes from. Pedernal Church comes from down around Taos. Uh, the other church, that's probably the, a lot of the local stuff. Um, quartzite, that's probably coming off the plains. We don't have uh, quartzite sources in, in the south. It's mostly fine grain volcanics, church, church, or uh, obsidian. And um, uh, I guess black basalt is a fine grain volcanic. So that's mostly what the sources are in the southwest. There's not a lot of quartzite. Uh, so that's probably where that is coming from. And then the white opalite, uh, they were using it uh, quite a bit. Uh, that local source that was found during the survey outside the rock shelter. Pretty interesting. Just uh, so the total lithics per level suggest occupational intensity increased through time, uh, likely beginning in the early Holocene. So we're talking, like I said, level 10 is probably around 10,000, 12,000 years old, but we'll have to do more research uh, to get the exact date of it. But I'm pretty certain it is Pleistocene sediment. Um, so beginning in the early Holocene and continuing regularly and repeatedly. So it looks like they just found it you know, in the late ice age. And then as people started to map on and use it more and more frequently, the intensity of it, uh, you know, continued to increase uh, as probably multiple prehistoric groups mapped it on and it became one of the destinations, you know, one of their hunting camps they would, they would hit every year as part of their settlement around. <clears throat> and of course, the intensity of it increased through time. And then it just drops off uh, to almost nothing. And it's really interesting because levels three and four coincided, that would be about 1500 years ago. That coincides with when the Pueblo period began. And if you think about it, this would be when that's, a, I mean, that is just a, uh, uh, a huge technological, you know, uh, uh, that shift between hunting and gathering and sedentism or, or Pueblos, I mean, must have just been this huge socio-political, technological, social, cultural, gigantic change uh, going from where groups were primarily using sites like this is embedded as part of their just normal life way. I mean, this is one of those major sites uh, they, would have, they would have visited every year, you know, as hunting and gatherers. Um, and then as people uh, became more sedentary and lived in Pueblos and farming and state societies and pastoralism and all that, uh, these kinds of sites were probably ephemeral to their life way. Uh, you might visit them every once in a while for a hunting party or something like that. But if you're growing corn and you, you're keeping animals, back at, at, at uh, your home base, at uh, your Pueblo or your city, uh, whatever, your, your sedentary location, that's where you're gonna be most of the time. So it, it looks like that coincides, this drop in use in the rock shelter coincides with when the late archaic ended and the Pueblo period began, which again, major shift in the way landscape use was going from nomadic hunting and gathering to sedentism. So that's basically what I'm, how that is being interpreted, this, this major drop. Of the 689 bone fragments included in the assemblage, uh, 249 were burned, like I talked about, and 74 or 11% displayed culture modification. Um, one of the things to note, and this is really interesting because it uh, uh, is that we actually did find some butchered bone in every single level, going down from level two all the way down to level 10. Uh, we had, we had definitive evidence of butchering, butchered bone, um, which again, just uh, suggests that these folks have been just continuously using this rock shelter. It's probably a hunting camp for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Uh, so uh, so of these bones, uh, almost all of them are large to medium-sized um, mammal long bones and flat bones. Uh, so basically choice pieces were being selected and brought back to the rock shelter. One of the cool things is uh, we know it's probably deer, elk, or bison sized based on the cortical bone thickness. So the uh, uh, average thickness was 5.8 millimeters. Whereas like, just give you some perspective, an adult male has about three to four millimeter uh, cortical bone thickness. So we were definitely, the animals that we were finding in this rock shelter were like large ungulates, uh, elk, bison, and deer probably. And those kind of animals don't go into rock shelters like that and just die. Uh, all of that bone, I'm, I'm guessing most of the bone that's in this rock shelter was brought there culturally and butchered. 
Uh, here's that great example of that green bone break. See those stone tool cut marks? This bone here was found down in level eight. So we're probably six to 8,000 years old. Uh, you can see that classic spiral fracture green bone break where that's from marrow processing. So this one was actually cut up and uh, uh, the marrow was processed out of it. The bones suggest the same thing as the lithics. Uh, they almost, they're, they're, they're mirror each other uh, as far as just occupational intensity increasing and then dropping off uh, right, right where that uh, Pueblo, late, uh, that uh, late prehistoric Pueblo period would have been. All right, so what do we know? La Cueva is a well-stratified rock shelter spanning the entire Holocene sequence. The macro, the macro stratigraphy appears mostly intact with some might have, why is this, uh, I'm seeing these words, but I, I'm some, somehow this is, uh, it, the words that I'm saying are being presented on the screen. Um, but yeah, I'll go back to the summary. Sorry, that threw me off. Uh, the macro stratigraphy appears mostly intact with some mycostratigraphic mixing. Uh, La Cueva was occupied by human groups probably since at least the early Holocene, like I talked about maybe 10,000 years ago. It appears occupations continually intensified as time progressed. The densest occupations were in levels four through seven, which would correspond with the middle and late archaic periods or between about 2,500 and about 5,500 years ago. Uh, of course, pressure flakes dominated the assemblage, suggesting that uh, groups were coming here uh, with already finished tools and using this primarily as a hunting camp. Uh, uh, and uh, they not only but hunted, butchered, and cooked large, medium-sized mammals, but they probably processed floral resources with the riparian area there and everything like that. Plus, we had groundstone and ceramics. Uh, and usually, groundstone and ceramics suggest some kind of plant processing uh, or floral processing. So they were probably doing that as well. As far as the research questions, I think we nailed the first two. Uh, I think we addressed the first two. We actually answered them. Um, exploring the long-term occupational history. Uh, yeah, there's at least continual and intensive occupation of that valley for probably 10,000 years, if not more. Uh, I can't wait to try to find more sites in that valley. Um, how are they used throughout time? I kind of talked about that, about how uh, there, there's that shift in the way it was used. It was used as a regular part of the settlement rounds during the Archaic, during the Pueblo period. It was probably used more uh, ephemerally and only for um, kind of marginally for hunting, uh, but much more occasionally. It, it, it fell out of being a major site on their settlement rounds. Did we find the last two questions? No, we didn't find Paleomedian artifacts. Uh, and like I said, I think there's the early Holocene late Pleistocene deposits in there, but we're going to have to actually get a radiocarbon date. Um, and, and so far, we haven't found a charcoal down there. But based on the way the sediment structure is, I am pretty sure we're at that transition. But we're going to have to do more research. And then here's just some of the things that we need to do uh, for future research. Um, I'm not going to, you guys can just read that. Uh, but one of the things I really want to do is expand public involvement. You can see the third bullet from the, from the top to allow more people an opportunity to experience archaeology like this. I mean, again, this is fun. I mean, we're having a lot of good fun, but we're also addressing some major research uh, and we're really uh, kind of furthering archaeological knowledge uh, in the San Luis Valley. So that's it. It's kind of uh, La Cueva Rock Shelter is a unique, well-stratified, multi-component archaeological site that's being investigated by numerous community groups. It was a Forest Service, UNM Taos, Taos Archaeological Society, uh, and a lot of interested members from, from the public. Um, it is a citizen science project and, and I'm looking forward to doing more of those uh, in the future. And it really does help further academic knowledge uh, regarding prehistory in the San Luis Valley, but it also really helps us with management data uh, so, the, so that the Forest Service can make better decisions about our cultural resources. We can quickly put things into context when we have this kind of information, these kind of sites. Uh, it also gives us relativity about significance. Um, this is a significant site. Uh, it, it, it helps uh, just with that evaluation when we make land management decisions. So that's it, guys. Uh, this is actually the professional, this is the whole professional crew right here. Um, the volunteers were, I took pictures of throughout the process, but this was the paid professional crew right here. You'll see, you see right here. Um, that's it. Anybody have any questions?
Thank you. That was great. I think we had one question from Greg in the chat earlier. Um, he was asking, was placing the rocks below a fire a method of heating them for use, or why would you um, sort of line the fire pit was just that kind of something they did? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, whoops. Got Let's you. stop sharing your screen so we can see your price. <laughs> okay, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to. Let me shut this. Stop share. Thank you. Hey, there you are. And sorry, I know I talk fast, uh, but I had to get, I had to be able to fit that into 45 minutes. So uh, as far as that, um, we see them like that prepared sometimes, and sometimes we don't. I would think it'd be, it would create more thermal. It, it would it'd be uh, better for cooking and heating things up, you know, just kind of creating a thermal bowl. But uh, we don't know uh, why sometimes parts are prepared that way and sometimes they're not. But I love it when they are because it preserves them better. So, you know, it keeps, keeps credits from burrowing through them. Um, but yeah, good question. So if I time travel, you want me to go back and tell all those folks to make the rocks uh, at the bottom of their pits, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. we'd have, uh, we have much better radiocarbon dates. Uh, <laughs> I'll work on that. We have a question from Paul. How can we participate as citizen scientists in these projects? Oh, uh, so like I was um, mentioning, that was the last real one I was uh, that I threw because that was pre-COVID. Uh, it's the last couple of summers uh, we haven't been able to kind of do that. But now that we're um, possibly, I don't know, you know, we're now we're possibly seeing the light into that tunnel. Who knows? It might slam back on us. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to start thinking about doing projects like this again. And I would probably advertise it through Greg or you, Hannah, or something like that. And just and maybe even interface with Katie, our volunteer coordinator, or something like that. I don't know uh, how it would actually look, but we, we would do an outreach on Facebook and through Greg and everything and, uh, and ask for volunteers. And um, usually a first come, first serve thing. So it can only take so many, you know, maybe 10 to 15 on a project like this. But um, I would take folks and tell them it filled up. Um, that's kind of how we'd probably arrange it. Uh, not sure if we'll be able to do it this summer again yet. Um, a little tentative with um, just kind of how the uh, COVID is going, but uh, we'll see. But yeah, I want to start doing these again as soon as I can. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions coming in? I'll give you a little bit of chance to consider questions for price. I, I, I mean, this is absolutely fascinating. I about have a thousand questions, one per 10 centimeters of excavation you guys have. So, um, but I, tell me, I, I, threw, I, I threw in the chat there the, the Rio Grande National Forest uh, home web page. And for, for two reasons, as Price suggested, if, if he's able to do this through citizen science efforts and volunteers, uh, there'll be a couple of places that we'll probably outreach that on. And one would be um, on the right-hand side of that page, you'll see volunteer opportunities. And on the left-hand side, side, you'll see news and events. So um, both of those places are where we'll um, advertise that. And of course, as Price mentioned, our Facebook page. So if you're not on Facebook, though, the web gives you an opportunity to look at that as well. And Margaret, uh, Margaret asked, can we visit the site or is it on private land? No, it's federal land. It's uh, on Forest Service land uh, up in the Rio Castilla Valley. Um, so yeah, it can be visited. Uh, that, that was a Forest Service road. You saw at the very beginning how our camp was in proximity to the rock shelter. That was a Forest Service road that was going through there. So um, yes, it can be visited. Any other questions coming in? I have another one. Price, um, do you have much, and, and maybe I wasn't paying full attention, which I'd be hard pressed to find out, but did you say anything about um, um, animal visits to the site and how they may or may not use the, the shelter, the cave? Animal? Yes. Oh, what do you mean, just like fighters <laughs> used it? Pardon? So there was, you mean like what kind of wildlife? Yes. Yeah, there was a lot of pack rats uh, that were using it. That's for sure. Um, 
we yeah we didn't we didn't think about it anymore. Oh, it said the host muted me. I don't know what. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so we found the... there wasn't a lot of evidence of like uh, critters using it. Uh, we did find a lot of pack rat mittens, um, which can be really interesting, and uh, especially on a site like that, because pack rats build those um, those mittens they have, and then they urinate on them, and they become like hard, like amber. Um, I was actually involved of, in a pack rat study in the Bighorns where we uh, where there was a twenty eight thousand year old pine cone. It was found at the base of a pack rat. I mean, the pack rat min was the size of your kitchen table, but we actually kind of sampled it and got to the bottom of it because they'll collect debris and then they'll put it into their thing. And then they'll, like I said, urinate on it and their urine turns hard like amber. So it preserves, it's really gross, but it, I mean, it really preserves stuff well. Pack rats were all over in there. That's the only critter that I, that I really saw evidence of being, using it. That's great. Thanks, Bryce. And it's also gross. <laughs> yeah, pack rat study is going to be really interesting. I would love to bisect some of the pack rat middens that are in that rock shelter. So Eric asked, how did and why did you decide to excavate this site as a shelter since it was identified as a mine? Oh, because I uh, like, yeah, I, I was driving by it, you know, I been on the job a little while like I, I was uh I was actually down on the Carson National Forest for about five years in the same role um before I came to the Rio and I was I had a uh a colleague of mine was driving me around the forest just showing me stuff we drove by that and they said oh yeah there's an old mine I was like really let's go look at it and, and he's like no it's just an old mine uh so I walked up to it and I was like this is a natural can cap it you know wow so this has been thought to be an old mine and he was like yeah all the local you know think it's a mine and I was like, can you imagine the preservation that must be in this rock shelter? Because <laughs> this is not a mine. This is a rock shelter. Um, and then, you know, I was told, no, 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 that's a mine. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do a test project in it. Uh, and then we'll, and we'll see. So that's why, because when I first saw it, I was like, this is not a mine. Uh, this is a natural feature. Um, any chance we could build this into a future cast trip? with you or someone who can talk intelligently about the site? Sure. You know, is that uh, Colorado Archaeological Society? Yes. Yeah, I'm the trip chairman for the White Speed Group of the CAS. And we've been thinking about a trip to the San Luis Valley. And I think this would be kind of the highlight of a trip to the San Luis Valley. Absolutely. I mean, we could see this site. There's a lot of other interesting sites. Um, but yeah, this one is this one's pretty neat. Yes, absolutely. We could uh, talk about that. When do you guys usually do that? Uh, well, all year round, whatever works best for where we're going. Probably wouldn't be this year, probably be next year. Sometime when the weather might be decent. Absolutely. I'd be all for it. Can the type of tool used or the way it was made be determined to tell what Native American tribe? Uh, tell what tribes these Native Americans belong to? So that's a really good question. Thanks for asking that, Anna Marie. Um, as far as ethnicity in the archeological record, uh, especially out West here and in the Southwest, uh, we can pretty much identify tribes, uh, maybe going back a thousand years. So uh, often through their ceramics or different types of artifacts, we can identify like, oh, this is you, this is Picarese, this is Santa Clara, this is, but once we get past about 1500 to 2000 years ago, uh, a lot of the hunting and gathering groups were doing the same thing and they were so nomadic. Uh, we of course don't have maps and we don't know how they moved around for thousands of years and who ended up where at what time and all that. So we really don't, can't get into ethnicity. Ethnicity is really difficult to get into prior to 1500 to 2000 years. So like I said, we can name tribes archeologically about somewhere between a thousand and two thousand years, depending on where you are in, in, in the country. Uh, but before that, we just called them prehistoric groups. So you'll often hear like late archaic groups or middle archaic groups or Paleo Indian groups or just that's what we'll refer to them as uh, because we just we don't know what the ethnicity is uh, beyond, like I said, in this area, probably 1500 years ago, 2000 years ago. 
So that's a good question. And I, I get that, I, I ask that pretty often. Um, uh, next one, yes, we will post the video. On, okay, yep, so that was you answering, Hannah. But yeah, good question. Right, so so like folks, I said, oh, sorry. Of, just gonna, oh, no worries, I was gonna say, folks, think of questions. Are they, is it okay if I pass out your email for them to reach out absolutely. if they have any specific questions? I'll put that in the chat. Yes, and we did, uh, so we did identify Taos Pueblo. So there's a definite Taos Pueblo occupation there um, with that Taos incised pottery that we found. Uh, no other cultural group would be associated with that. So, um, and again, that was around a thousand years ago. Before that, as I mentioned, late archaic groups, uh, da, 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 you know, I referred to things as like Hannah and, and uh, San Jose and just things like that. When you get that back that far in time, when those kind of uh, points are dated for the first time. They're often named after like an individual, the researcher that was doing it, or after a river valley, after a landform, after a town nearby, after, you know, so San Jose was obviously, obviously named after a town. Uh, but uh, whereas McKean, that was the guy that was doing the research. So he named the point when he first named and dated it in a bison kill in Wyoming, he named it McKean. Then he named the variants of it, Duncan and Hannah, his kids. So uh, yeah, the way these things get named prior to uh, a thousand years ago is, is pretty interesting. So that's a, that's a good question. All right, Price, I think we'd better get ready to wrap it up. I don't wanna have uh, folks drop off and miss the chance to uh, win one of the cool door prizes for tonight. So, uh, I'm guessing Hannah's done some work in the background and found us a winner for the San Juan Mountains Association, uh, otherwise known as SJMA. Um, you got that water bottle and and uh, there was something else. Yeah, I'm guessing you found a name for us too, right? Our water bottle and book um, today goes to Marie Luna who joined us. Um, so Marie, if you could uh, send me a message with, um, if you wanna pick it up at one of our offices or if you're not um, too close by, we can always pop it in the mail. Um, if you could drop me your email, if you haven't already, um, or phone number and we'll reach out how to get best get that to you. And thank you all again for joining and to Bryce for presenting. That was awesome. We're glad to have you all here and listening in. Um, so coming up next on our forest special series next month, we are going to have women in public lands leadership. So we're going to have um, a bunch of women across our land management agencies um, sharing their knowledge and experience um, in public lands um, leadership and management. So looking forward to that. That is going to be April 13th, Wednesday, right back here on Zoom. Right on, Hannah. Thanks so much for that. And everybody, thank you on behalf of Rio Grande National Forest and San Juan Mountains Association. We sure appreciate your attendance tonight and your interest in your national forests. Have a great time. We'll see you guys next time, wherever that may be.